Uh, thank you very much. Um, and just while people are getting settled, um, just a couple of uh, comments uh, of my own. My name is Jamie Cameron. I'm one of the uh, co-chairs of the conference. And um, I think I could go out on a limb here and say on behalf of myself and my two co-chairs, Ben and Sonia, as well as on behalf of the Dean who's sitting right in front of me, that uh, I think we've, uh, we're very, very pleased about the way the morning has gone and we're looking forward to the afternoon program as well, which will begin in just a moment. Um, I, I would like to take a, a second or two just to uh, say a few of my own thank yous. Um, I've been fortunate to have had a, a very, very long run of personal involvement in the, in the conference. This is the 17th annual. Uh, many of you will know that the conference was uh, inaugurated by Patrick Monaghan, um, my colleague who's now the Deputy Minister of um, um, the Attorney General's office. And uh, I do want to um, acknowledge my personal debt to Patrick and our debt to Patrick for starting the conference. Um, and for many years, uh, it was for a few years it was Patrick, and then it was Patrick and Jamie, and then it was Patrick and Jamie and Bruce, so I also want to um, uh, do a shout out to Bruce Ryder, who was a co-chair of this conference for many years as well. And then it was um, uh, Jamie and Bruce, and then it was uh, Jamie and Bruce and Sonia. Then it was, uh, I'm getting mixed up. But uh, the point being that a number of us have been involved collegially over the years in um, in putting the conference on every year and in, in maintaining the conference and developing it. And so we're just so very happy that the conference is at Osgood this year. Um, we also want to acknowledge the support we've had from Osgood Professional Development OPD over the uh, last many years and thank them also for helping us with the videotaping today, which will create a record of the conference. Um, also, it's been done before, but I need to say it myself, we, all of us, the co-chairs, we really want to thank uh, Jody Ann Rowe Butler in particular uh, for uh, the work she's done on the conference. In the past, the administrative work on the conference has been done by a, a battery of um, OPD workers, and this year it's been done primarily by one person. And so she's not in the room because she's probably doing something for us, but we're very, very, thank you, Jody Ann. We're very, very grateful for everything you've done for us. <laughs> and last but not least, I want to mention James Cheng. Uh, James Cheng is a former student um, uh, at Osgood Hall. He's graduated several years ago now, but James is, uh, ever since he graduated and even before he graduated, has been willing to help us at Osgood Hall with design work. And uh, he is the uh, design artist for the program and the website and everything that we've done this year. And uh, once again, we're just very happy to have that continuity with James and to have his help with the uh, design of the program. And I think I've got everyone's attention now, uh, which means it's the right time uh, to introduce our keynote guest speaker, um, Ms. Dahlia Lithwick, who is um, very well known to everyone in the room, I'm sure. Uh, she's best known, I think, as a U.S. Supreme Court commentator for Slate, uh, where she uh, writes uh, Supreme Court dispatches and jurisprudence. Many of you also know, I mean, we wouldn't forget a moment of pride like this, that uh, Dolly is a Canadian, and we, uh, we welcome her home today. Um, and, and of necessity, uh, because I'm, we've been doing it to everyone else, I'm going to keep this introduction short. Um, and the only thing I'm going to do is just give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the uh, posts I found on Slate, uh, just in a quick check yesterday. This is a flavor of some of the recent stories. March 19th. 2014. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is irreplaceable. All you liberals trying to push her out, think about that. February 25th, 2014. Pre-racial. Justice Clarence Thomas says blacks didn't think about race in the 1950s South. Same day. Stand your ground nation. America used to value the concept of retreat. Now we just shoot. More recently, Justice Roberts hearts billionaires. And this is in reference to the most recent First Amendment campaign expense decision. The Chief Justice doesn't believe 
or doesn't care that money corrupts politics. And I've got a final one. It's not so much about the Supreme Court or about law, but just the same, it was a quick favorite of mine um, in looking at some of Dahlia's work. This one's called Toronto's Gollum. <laughs> Rob Ford delights Canadians by ending their centuries-long reputation for dorkiness. <laughs> well, uh, we note that milestone was sadness, by the way. Uh, anyway, you can see that for completely different reasons than Rob Ford, uh, Dahlia does not have any personal problems with dorkiness. And uh, to me, she seems clearly to be a person is having, who is having way too much fun uh, writing all her stories uh, that prod and push and give a little bit of edge uh, to the commentary that she gives about the US Supreme Court. And I almost forgot, the title of her uh, presentation today is Women and the Court. Do women justices judge different? And why do Americans care so much? Please join me in welcoming uh, Dahlia Lithwick. Thank you for the conference. I, I'm about to completely undermine the dorkiness thing by showing you the shoes that I'm wearing right now. I decided not to change uh, into my uncomfortable shoes because I feel so at home. Um, I, wrote a, I wrote a text to my husband that said, why do Americans have such angry eyebrows? Canadians don't. What is that about? And he wrote back and said, are you coming home? Um, so it's really good to be home. Uh, I really want to thank uh, Jamie and Sonia and Ben and Osgood uh, for bringing me here. It's, it's, you know, I got married in Toronto. My family's here. So it really uh, does feel like home with comfortable shoes. I should also just note that Jamie didn't read, the only piece from the last month you didn't read was the one where I covered the contraception mandate case. And I, and I compared every one of the nine justices to a different uh, method of contraception, thus ensuring that I'll be covering the Sup Canadian Supreme Court next year because they're going to lock me out. Um, so, so my topic today is, is women and judging, and particularly women in the Supreme Court, although I really want to uh, associate myself with Rosemary's remarks this morning that I think the focus on uh, diversity at the Supreme Court does real violence to the lack of discussion that we have about uh, diversity in lower courts around the country. But that said, I'm going to talk about the Supreme Court. Um, but you're going to have to, in order to, to hear my talk, stipulate to two things with me today. Uh, one of them is that Americans and the American public in particular are just deeply, deeply weird about gender and politics. Weird in ways that you cannot begin to fathom. Um, my only evidence that I will offer you of this point, and then I think we really can stipulate, is that Michelle Obama, Harvard graduate who in fact helped put her husband through school, had to get up at the Democratic National Convention in 2012 talk about her life history without ever mentioning Harvard Law School and called herself the mom in chief. Uh, so anxious are Americans about talking openly about uh, women, uh, powerful women in political roles. The second thing you're going to have to stipulate to, and here I'm going to lose Adam, is my emerging theory of the craziness of the American confirmation system. And my emergent, uh, and, I, and I absolutely agree that yours is, or ours, I don't know how to do this, but let's say the Canadian system is deeply, deeply dysfunctional, although I'm going to go out on a limb and say that ours is worse. Um, and my emergency, uh, emerging theory of what is going on with the confirmation process goes like this. Uh, as you probably know, there are no cameras allowed in the US Supreme Court. Uh, as you probably know, unlike uh, the Canadian system where there's just a few hours of confirmation hearing, we have five endless days. Uh, by day four, even the, the, the nominee himself or herself is bringing a flask. It is so endless that it cannot be done without alcohol. Um, it's done under the bright Klieg lights, an endless sort of that golfer, nothing is happening. We're at the ninth hour still, nothing is happening. Uh, and yet unremitting press attention, we all fill the room and type and type and type as though something might happen. Um, my dad once caught me out. Uh, I got an email while I was covering the John Roberts hearing. My dad said, is that you that I'm seeing on C-SPAN in that black jacket? And I said, yes, it's me. And he said, close the solitaire, because I was playing solitaire. <laughs> 
for the world to see. So I, I just, why do I think the confirmation process makes things worse? Because uh, the confirmation is televised, court proceedings are not televised, and uh, as you heard this morning, the justices cannot talk about anything. They cannot talk about any case that has happened, any case that is happening, or any case that might happen. And so instead of talking about jurisprudence or their views or their ideology, what they tend to talk about is what I think is all the issues that they sublimate the rest of the time. So it becomes a place to talk about race, gender, sex, sexual orientation, all the things that Americans feel uncomfortable talking about openly in other political fora get discussed, just worked out, like flushed out right here uh, in front of the Klieg lights because there's nothing else to say. So I think if I were to have a different name for the American confirmation process, I might call it more and more, think of Clarence Thomas, uh, the theater of the American id where we just are just working out our stuff and we're gonna do it right here on national television and it's gonna be just terrible. And so, not surprisingly, it's just terrible. If you believe me that this is what the confirmation process has become, then it's clear watching particularly the last two confirmations that involved uh, women, all of the American anxiety about women and their biases and how they are uh, too emotional and how they can be bullies and aggressive gets worked out in the confirmation process. And to me, it signals really a deep, deep problem that Americans have talking in a normal way, in a big girl voice, uh, about gender and race. So the question that I would ask you is, are women justices different? And more urgently, why do Americans think they are here in 2014? And I'm going to present my remarks to you, and I'm going to kind of go quickly so I can take questions, as what I think is a sort of play in five acts, looking at five different eras on the US Supreme Court and how we've talked about women in each of those eras. And I want to give you this caveat. You like that? I'm five minutes in, and we have two stipulations and a caveat. Um, uh, the caveat is that this is a, a, a time period that covers 30 years, right? This is a very, very short time and an end of, of four justices. So any generalizations we attempt to make is about four women justices over 30 years, uh, and it's never smart to extrapolate from an N of four. It is never smart to extrapolate about such a short time period, but here I go. So I'm going to start with the question of does gender matter at all in the Supreme Court when the first woman comes to the Supreme Court? What I would call my act one, a different voice. And this era starts in 1981 when Sandra Day O'Connor is elevated to the Supreme Court. She is explicitly elevated because Ronald Reagan has made a campaign promise to put a woman on the court. So all the anxiety about whether she's been put on the court because she's a girl goes away because she clearly has. And she's, by the way, quite fine with that and throughout her life kind of thinks of herself as an affirmative action baby at the court. Uh, but O'Connor becomes an American icon. She still is one of the most recognizable uh, uh, public figures in the country. She is really a funny rock star character. She gets more male than most justices because it's so profoundly important uh, for Americans, particularly American girls, that there's finally uh, a woman at the court. But the legal academy is never content to just be happy. They want to and, and really deeply probe whether she judges like a woman. And so within five years of her arrival at the court, we begin this sort of experiment in the jurisprudence of women. And so we get in 1986, uh, a, a pretty systemic effort by Professor Susanna Sherry at Vanderbilt University to look at all of the O'Connor opinions over five years and figure out if O'Connor judges like a woman. And what does she come up with? Well, she comes up with, having looked at these, these opinions, she says, O'Connor judges like a woman because she tends to be relational, her word. She tends to be care-focused and other-focused. She tends to have an ethos of care, quote, that informs the way she thinks about cases. Now, if any of this sounds familiar to people who took women's studies, this is because it's rooted in this seminal book by Carol Gilligan in 1982 called In a Different Voice. And Cal Carol Gilligan uh, wrote a book saying boys and girls think differently and they talk differently. And it's because men and boys like rules. They like neutral principles, whereas women want to take care of people. 
And what girls want to do mostly is look at the sort of totality of the circumstances and make things right. Men like bright line rules, and that's uh, uh, Carol Gilligan, and that gets kind of imported wholesale into Susanna Sherry's reading of O'Connor cases. Now, if you look at O'Connor's jurisprudence, it is actually true that what Susanna Sherry flags is an important thread in what O'Connor finds. O'Connor is deeply concerned about the outsider, about the one-time only pragmatic solution that helps the person in religion cases, it's the religious outsider. Um, in the affirmative action cases, it's the person who's benefiting from affirmative action, uh, the need for diversity. So she is, in a sense, focused on these one-time only pragmatic caregiving rules. But I should also add that O'Connor hates this study more than she hates anything in the world. And what O'Connor says in 1991 of both the Sherry essay and conversations like the one we're having is that this kind of our voice theory is, quote, dangerous and unanswerable. She does not like this kind of thinking and she certainly doesn't want to talk about it. I want to just footnote, to go with my caveat, the O'Connor piece of the story by telling you that it is no small irony that when O'Connor leaves the Supreme Court, she leaves to take care of her ailing husband. She's at the top of her game. She could have stayed on the court and has proven she could have stayed on the court for years and been the determinative fifth vote at the court. She leaves to care for a husband. And I think it's not entirely inconsequential because we certainly know a lot of male justices uh, up to and including William H. Rehnquist who had ailing spouses who never felt impelled to leave to care for them. So that care ethos, as much as we want to dismiss it as utterly meaningless, comes to be the bookmark at the end of, of uh, a soaring career for Sandra Day O'Connor. All right, this brings me to my second act, what I want to call differing voices. Because the surest thing you can do to screw up a study on women's voices is bring another woman into the picture. And in 1993, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is elevated to the bench, and every single systemic study utterly collapses under the weight of her jurisprudence, which is nothing like ethos of care, other focused, problem solving, uh, pragmatic one case only. Ginsburg is fond of bright line tests. She writes like Scalia does. She likes clear rules. She's a rights oriented person, not a care oriented person. And she utterly scrambles the notion of what female jurists do uh, and it's quickly clear when you look at the studies that compare the two of the two voices of O'Connor and Ginsburg uh, that they don't actually agree on anything. So uh, one study that was done by Karen O'Connor in 2010 shows that O'Connor and Ginsburg actually only agreed 52% of the time. So much for women's voices. But interesting, and let's note this for later, in all of the gender-related cases the two women sit on together, they agree 90% of the time. So while they don't agree, their jurisprudence does not map, it maps pretty precisely when it comes to issues of gender. All right, so then O'Connor leaves, as I said, to care for an ailing husband, and American, America goes slightly crazy. O'Connor, who has said her whole life that gender doesn't matter at the court, is caught fly fishing, of course, the day that John uh, Roberts is, is named as her successor. And what she says is, quote, to the news, Chief John Roberts, uh, I guess he wasn't chief then, John Roberts is, quote, good in every way except he's not a woman. So clearly for O'Connor, while gender doesn't matter, it matters, even when you're fly fishing. Uh, a CNN poll that's taken at the time shows that 80% of Americans think O'Connor must be replaced by a woman. Uh, so even if O'Connor thinks it doesn't matter except when it does, Americans seem to think it matters, which brings us to Harriet Myers. We're done with Harriet Myers. Uh, you, think, you all think you have a bungled uh, justice. That was bad. Uh, and after Harriet Myers uh, is pulled back, is withdrawn, um, the court puts forth uh, John Roberts and Sam Alito. So this brings me to my third act, which um, are the years in which uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg sits alone at the high court, and I think is really a profoundly interesting time to think about gender and the U.S. Supreme Court. So I'm going to acutely call this uh, era 
indifferent voices. So Ginsburg becomes increasingly frustrated at the indifferent voices all around her on the court. And Ginsburg, it's interesting, it's worth noting, comes to the court having you know, founded the ACLU's Women's Rights Project. She's supposed to be this crusading women's right jurist, except of course she never was. Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had tremendous success as a litigator at the court because she was always collegial and soft-spoken. She was never, uh, people have this idea in their heads that Ginsburg is some kind of hybrid of Gloria Steinem and Thurgood Marshall. She's not. She's a little old Jewish lady. She's been a little old Jewish lady since she was four and, you know, she is not, she is not uh, somebody who is yelling and screaming about gender at the court. And with the, I think, exception of uh, the Virginia military case where she did write with a powerfully gendered voice, she tried really hard uh, to not be the feminist at the court. But this era, this uh, third period I want to talk about is, I think, very, very poignant uh, for thinking about women's voices in the law. So a few things happen, I won't belabor them. In 2007, the US Supreme Court hands down the Lilly Ledbetter case uh, having to do with fair pay and whether women should know uh, the instant they're discriminated against that they're being discriminated against. Uh, a 5-4 decision written by Justice uh, Sam Alito. And Ginsburg writes a pretty blistering dissent where she says, uh, these people have no idea what it's like to be a woman in the workforce. Gender discrimination does not work the way the majority thinks it works. And she goes further. She goes off the record and tells USA Today that she is convinced, quote, that Sandra Day O'Connor would have sided with her. There would have been a 5-4 majority for Lily Ledbetter had O'Connor still been on the court. Query whether that was wise, but that's what she said. This um, sort of continues with 2009 in what I think is one of the really landmark cases to watch uh, Ginsburg's voice emerge as a kind of alone and, and, and beleaguered, and that's uh, Safford versus Redding. This is this strip search case where uh, a little girl, a little high school girl, is strip searched because she may or may not be carrying contraband ibuprofen, uh, which she's supposed to be peddling, and the school strip searches her, and there's this question about whether uh, the, the search is permissible, and the justices proceed to have some kind of Porky's weird comedy fest with it. So a lot of the male justices don't take seriously what it means uh, to have school administrators touching your body and asking you uh, to shake out your bra and your underwear. And there's just a lot of humor and sort of bonhomie going on. And it culminates in Justice Stephen Breyer accidentally uh, saying that when he was, in, this is no different from being in gym class. And when he was in gym class, people used to stick things in his underwear. And and then everybody laughs, and then he says, I don't mean people stuck things in my under. Everybody's just rollicking good time. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg is sitting there. You can hear her jaw drop. And she's sitting there, and she's saying, this is nothing like changing for gym class. This is school administrators strip searching a little girl without warning her parents, without her consent, without her understanding. This isn't funny at all. One interesting I want to flag, thing I want to flag for you is that uh, the U.S. Supreme Court is overwhelmingly female for reasons that I find fascinating and inscrutable, but may have to do with a long summer recess. Um, but we, we, most of the women who cover the Supreme Court very, very carefully also try not to write as women. Reading case in 2009 is a really interesting exception, where Nina Totenberg comes out and reports on NPR that these justices seem to have no idea that uh, being strip searched for a girl is not like gym class. And as she writes, that parading around naked might be something that boys like to do. It's not something that teenage girls like to do. Uh, Joan Biskupic writes about it in that tone. I wrote about it in that tone. There was a real sense on the part of the female press corps that something failed to be understood by the male justices that day. And that Ginsburg, who was trying to make herself heard, was getting kind of laughed down. Um, after that case, again, while the case is pending, after oral argument, which by the way, we were all predicting based on oral argument that the school district would win by a, probably a 6-3 margin based on the questions. While the case is pending, Ginsburg gives yet another interview to USA Today where she says, we need another woman on this court. And she says specifically, men simply don't share female sensitivities. And I just, 
you know, think we need another woman. And everybody's shocked, and lots of people say this is inappropriate. But I will tell you that the outcome in the case comes out uh, eight to one uh, for Savannah Redding. And so clearly something about going uh, off the record, complaining to the public and to the press, at least slightly leads the justices to rethink um, whether this case is about uh, gym class. So now I want to get to Act 4, because this is the one where things get crazy. And I call this the voice of empathy. Now, you may or may not remember Empathy Gate here, but in the United States, it begins and ends over about two weeks. In 2009, uh, when David Souter sits, uh, 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 steps down from the court, uh, President Obama floats the notion of empathy as the quality he's looking for in his next appointment to the court. He should have said homicidal maniac because it would have had about the same outcome in the press. Empathy was immediately seen, first of all, as a dog whistle for a woman. Uh, remember, this is while uh, the Redding case is going on and there's a fierce discussion at the court and around the court about whether gender matters at the court. And immediately, there's a national discourse about whether empathy means woman and woman means bias. And that's the conversation we had for two short weeks until Obama stopped saying empathy and when Justice Sotomayor, who he tapped for that seat, was asked if she suffered uh, from uh, an empathy disorder, she was quick to throw the president under the bus and say, as someone noted this morning, I just call balls and strikes. I have no empathy and never have. Um, <laughs> So I want to just talk about what I call the wise Latina death spiral, for which this empathy conversation set Sotomayor up. Because it was really, you know, if, if you believe what I said, which is that these confirmation hearings are a way to talk about things, that there doesn't seem to be a polite space to talk about them, somehow the confirmation hearings for Sotomayor became a safe space to say, that Latino women are bullies and they're biased. And it wasn't one day of that, it was five days of that. And it was, for someone sitting in the room, again, without a flask, it was extraordinary to see this conversation play out in this way. So I want to just look back and, and, and think about what Sotomayor said about gender and judging and how it was perceived. So uh, Sotomayor in, 20, uh, in 2001, is asked to go to Berkeley and give a speech about gender and judging. And she said, she's being told, I want you to react to the comment, that's a famous Sandra Day O'Connor comment, <coughs> that at the end of the day, a wise old man and a wise old woman will always come up with the same result. What do you think then Judge Sotomayor? She was on the Second Circuit. And she said, and I'm going to quote her, a wise Latina woman with the richness of her experiences would more often than not reach a better conclusion than a white male who hasn't lived that life. That was the quote. America goes crazy. First of all, th th this was perceived as a huge gotcha until it turned out this was her stump speech and she'd given it many times. It wasn't a big gotcha. This is what she really felt. Um, but whatever she was trying to tease out, and I would submit that what she was trying to tease out is similar to what you heard this morning, which is sometimes uh, an experience informs one's thinking, and you can't disaggregate your life experience from your judgment. Uh, the, the, the confirmation really became a referendum on whether she was not just um, racist for saying that, but a racist bully. Not clear why the bully uh, language comes in, but then she's really being called out for that. Now, the question I want to ask at this point is, what does the data say? Are women judges biased? Are we too emotional? Are we too uh, empathetic? Are we just incapable of judging? Well, so interestingly, of course, and this again goes back to what we heard this morning, it's almost impossible, these studies are almost impossible uh, to really look at because you can't control for the other more important variables like political ideology and other things that, so there's never gonna be a really good study that shows you what a woman's brain really does when she's on the bench. But one interesting study I wanna flag for a minute is a path-breaking study from 2008 by Christina Boyd, Andrew Martin, and Lee Epstein, and it shows two things. When you have panels of three appellate judges and they only look at sex discrimination cases, so they're now looking at every sex discrimination case that's come down and been heard by three judge panel. One is that 
the, the male judges are 10% more likely to side with men when they hear these cases. But the two is that as soon as there's a female judge introduced onto the panel, the likelihood that the male judges will vote with the female judges rises significantly, rises up to 16%. There's other studies that, that corroborate this effect. There's a Yale Law Journal study from 2005 that confirms this effect. The presence of one female on any panel with males more than doubles, in this case, the chance that the male will conform his vote to the female, the female on the panel. Another study uh, uh, in 2010 uh, looks at Sandra Day O'Connor and what happened when she joins uh, the Supreme Court to Rehnquist jurisprudence. And in all gender cases, for gender claims, Rehnquist goes from agreeing with the plaintiff 25% of the time. When O'Connor comes on the court, remember he went to school with her, they were friends for years and years, suddenly he's agreeing with the woman 50% of the time. So now we could, we could question why uh, men are beginning to conform their views to those of women when they're women on the panel. It's an interesting problem. It might be log rolling. It might be silencing. We don't really know. But there is this intriguing possibility, which is that if there, if there is such a thing as female judicial thinking, it may be contagious. And it may just be, and here's the radical part, that men can catch it too. And that thinking like a woman is not innate. It's something that has to do with different experiences. Um, and we know this, and you know this, and we talked about it this morning, that you know, By Byron White always used to say that having Thurgood Marshall on the Supreme Court with him changed everything. And his quote was, Thurgood Marshall would tell us things we all knew, but we would rather forget. That was his description of what having someone in the room with you could do. It wasn't that they think like a, an African American and you think like a white person, but that their, their shared experience, their collective uh, experience is so profoundly different that you forget that that experience is of consequence as well. Linda Greenhouse, who for a long, long time uh, was my hero at the Supreme Court and covered it for, for uh, the New York Times, puts it this way. She says that having different voices, any different voices on the court, pushes us to know what we don't know. And that's really what we're talking about. Stopping and thinking, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg would say, what it's like to be manhandled by school administrators if you're a girl, and what it's like to be changing for Jim if you're a boy. Now, I think I want to end with my act five. It seems right. This is in Shakespeare where everybody's bloody on the ground. But, but mine ends better. Uh, and my, my act five is uh, what happens when there are three voices at the court. Um, and at least in my view, the Elena Kagan hearing was much less gender crazy than um, the Sotomayor hearing. And that the issues that came up, in part because I think of her <coughs> posture, how she came to the court, she had been Solicitor General before, uh, but also in part I think because um, uh, there was just a deference to her on the part of the senators uh, that we hadn't seen uh, in, in the Sotomayor hearings was quite, I thought, uh, quite a bit less gender fraught. I think um, Kagan also proved that when you're asked, as she was asked, uh, what were you doing on Christmas Eve when the bomber was caught, and you answer, like all Jews, I was probably at a Chinese restaurant, um, you can diffuse everything with one well-placed joke. Uh, and she really did, I think, very deftly, deftly handle the Senate in a way that Sotomayor could not. Uh, but I want to I want to point out that to the extent that three is a magic number at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, there's really good studies that show that as soon as you have three women on a corporate board, they all begin to talk. And that while there's one woman on a corporate board, she's terrified to talk because she's going to sound like she's speaking for all women. And that's not a position anyone wants to be in. And that effect seems to linger through two. Uh, but when you get a third woman on a board, they all talk and it turns out uh, they all are different. And that seems to be where we are right now at the Supreme Court with three women who are, you know, 
let's agree, aligned ideologically and politically, but all talk and I think and think and write in very, very dramatically different ways. And I think it's an incredibly useful thing for law students coming up now to have those three voices at the court and not the Susanna Sherry study saying uh, women try to fix problems and be relational. So I just want to close by saying that when I worry about women's voices at the US Supreme Court, what I don't worry about anymore is the notion that people think we have one biased, bossy, monolithic voice. I think that era may be behind us. I do worry about uh, other issues at the Supreme Court. I think that we're not going to have a mother on the US Supreme Court for a long time. I think the era of having women who had it all, who had children and careers, uh, and then got elevated to the court may be behind us. I worry about the extent to which, and we talked about this this morning also, the very, very narrow bandwidth of job experience going on to the Supreme Court. I'm, sus I'm very suspicious that we could never get another ACLU uh, attorney confirmed to the US Supreme Court anymore. So I'm not so much worried about lack of diversity in terms of women. I am worried about the lack of diversity at the court. I think it's important to understand that all nine of the justices come from two law schools. Their clerks all come from about eight. And that when I worry about the lack of voices at the court, it's not about gender anymore. It's about uh, experience and history and uh, about sort of breadth of vision. And if what I've been telling you is that breadth of vision is contagious, uh, I think that, that we almost are in a situation at the US Supreme Court where uh, you know, they are in lockdown when it comes to breadth of vision. I think that's where we have to change. So I want to thank you so very much for your patience. I know you've been hearing people talk all day. I'm happy to take questions about this or Hobby Lobby or McCutcheon or anything else, but I mostly thank you for making me feel so welcome. Thank you. Yeah, Dahlia, up on that invitation. And while people are coming to the microphones, um, we'll take time for a few questions. Try and keep them short if you can, so we can squeeze more in um, if there are questions. And I'm just uh, put in mind, as people are thinking about that, of uh, Bertha Wilson, uh, who was uh, by herself in R versus Morgenthaler, saying uh, no man can know what it is like to be a woman um, having an unwanted pregnancy. Then, just a couple years later, might be wrong about the date, 1991, R versus Lavalley. They're in the judge's elevator. Brian Dixon says, well, that's an easy case. Bertha Wilson says, not so fast. A few months later, uh, she changed the minds of all the male judges on that panel and uh, wrote a la landmark decision uh, recognizing uh, battered wife syndrome in Canada for the first time. And you can check that out. It's in uh, Bob Sharp and Kent Roach's biography of Dixon, that's exactly what happened. It's um, in the elevator. Uh, the male judges says, well, that said, that's an easy case. And it came out completely differently. Chan, please go ahead. Uh, thanks so much for a great talk. Uh, you may have, I don't know if you've been following the debate here we've been having in Canada about um, the Law Society's recognition of Trinity Western, which is an evangelical law school. Um, but of course, in the US, they've, they've, we've had Hobby Lobby, um, and last week the court refused to grant cert in Elaine Photography, which is perhaps the most comparable case in their context of the public accommodation. So I was wondering, maybe you could tell the audience a little bit about Elaine, and, and are you disappointed that the court did not take Elaine to examine what's pretty much a similar issue to uh, what we've got here? So, so um, uh, I think, first of all, it's a, it's a great question, and I think this the new civil rights, at least, you know, the only civil rights left in the United States discourse is the rights of religious objectors. Uh, and the Roberts course, Court has shown less and less solicitude. You know, if you look at the Roberts Court that has no patience for voting rights in Shelby County and no patience for, uh, you know, the rights of, of criminal defendants, no pa has infinite patience uh, for religious objectors. And so the question is about this, this sort of huge rush of cases that comes up that is about religious objectors. The first one is Hobby Lobby, which is, uh, the, I think, the landmark case of the term. And that is uh, employers, religious employers, who don't want to call, uh, comply with the so-called contraception mandate, part of Obamacare, which requires them to provide uh, contraception to all employees. And they object, even though you know science, fact, and, and um, the medical community agree that these are not 
abortifacients. They don't cause abortions, but it's, it's agreed by both the court and the objectors that for purposes of oral argument, for purposes of these cases, these uh, items are believed for, with deep religious conviction to cause abortions, and so they want to be opted out of the obligation to provide them. And uh, the case was argued two weeks ago at the Supreme Court, and I think it certainly looks, I was saying at lunch, as though there are going to be five votes uh, that will allow, uh, you know, contrary to uh, uh, Scalia's own opinion in Smith versus Employment Division, uh, to opt out of neutral uh, uh, laws, neutral civil rights laws, if they have a religious objection to it. The case comes up under First Amendment grounds and, and RIFRA, under Religious Freedom uh, Restoration Act grounds. It looks like there are five votes, I think, to say that religious employers are going to have an opt-out from, you know, in this case, providing contraception, but in the next case, I guess, uh, uh, you know, if, if they have a problem with uh, blood transfusions, AIDS medications. It's hard to say what the what the principle would be to stop any religious uh, employer uh, from granting uh, those things to employees. Um, and then Elaine's photography is a case that comes up uh, with a photographer who simply wants to deny service uh, to same-sex couples uh, because she has a moral, and she says, religious objection to offering that service. Uh, they win uh, at the state level, and the Supreme Court denies, uh, re re decides not to hear the case. Uh, the most interesting thing I can say is I would commend to you, it sounds like Green Linda Greenhouse Day, but Linda had a fantastic piece last week trying to square why the case didn't take Elaine's photography. And what she says is that Justice Kennedy, who wants to be remembered as the great, he will be the one who gave uh, gay marriage to America when he does it, is really stuck because he also wants to be the guy who gives religious freedom uh, to America. And Elaine's puts those two on a collision course. And he has to make a determination if he's going to be the one who decides when the Virginia uh, gay marriage case comes to the court and he decides that we're gonna, we're gonna give gay marriage to America once and for all. What's he gonna do when he's given every American a veto? Uh, and so I think it's at least worth thinking about how Kennedy squares those two values in his head, but I think that might be the reason the court wasn't quite ready to hear Elaine's. What do you think, Dahlia? Should we let the dean ask a question? Yeah, a quick no, one. I got, I got a plane to catch. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, moving beyond uh, the sort of uh, Shakespearean arc, I was thinking as you were finishing up of what Act Six uh, could look like. And, you know, we, I, I think it could go one of two directions, one of which we've experienced in Canada, one of which we haven't. Uh, one, Act 6, is the first uh, woman to serve as the Chief Justice and exercise that kind of leadership, both uh, symbolic and, and, um, uh, and substantive. And we've, of course, uh, had um, uh, now a uh, Chief Justice um, for you know, over a decade, and, uh, and it's, it's just become such a new normal, it's hard to imagine uh, the shockwaves uh, that sent uh, when it happened. And then the other version of this would be a majority uh, court of women. And we have had four of the nine uh, here. We've had courts of appeal, uh, like the Alberta Court of Appeal, that had a majority. But it's fair to say that that didn't really attract uh, the Sturm and Drang you're talking about. Uh, in the US, which is likelier? And will there be significance? Or is it that tipping point that by the time Act 6 happens, uh, it'll be a non-issue in the way the first Jewish Supreme Court justice attracted huge scrutiny. And now I think most people wouldn't be able to tell you how many American or Canadian Supreme Court judges uh, were of that faith because it's become such a non-issue. Uh, so I love that question. And I, I think the answer I would uh, defer to Walter Dellinger, who was the Solicitor General, the acting Solicitor General under Bill Clinton. And when I asked him this question, are we going to keep counting? You know, is it going to go three women, four women? And he said, think about geography. Think about how it used to be vitally important on the U.S. Supreme Court to have a California justice, a Midwestern justice, one New York justice, one. That mattered. Think about religion, right? We used to, it used to be critically important to have the Jewish justice, the Catholic justice. Those issues, when, they, when the sort of massive national anxiety over those issues ramps down, we stop, that stops being that central anxiety. So geography is no longer an anxiety for Americans. And if you tell them, oh, by the way, half of your Supreme Court from, comes from New York, they don't, not only do they not notice, but they don't care. They don't think it informs uh, judicial thinking. Uh, and they don't care about not only geography, but I would submit, you know, we have six Catholic justices on the US Supreme Court. And Americans don't 
generally think that's an issue. They may after ho Hobby Lobby, but they don't generally think it's an issue. Uh, and in fact, you know, you can't even talk about it. It's so not an issue. So I think it really kind of tends to rise and fall with other social anxieties. And I think that gender is one of those things about which, and this is beyond my ken because I'm not Freud, why Americans are so stressed out about what women want. And I, I don't know why that's still happening, but I think while that continues to be a high, high anxiety issue, we will continue to count. Okay, we're gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to end the session. I'm so disappointed, what a treat it has been. And I'm so glad you kept those Canadian style shoes on. Thank you. Show the audience. <laughs> Sonia, do not let Dahlia forget her speaker shoes. They're <laughs> at the front under the table. Uh, as I said, it's been a real treat for me and for everyone in the audience to welcome you home to Canada. Thank you. And to our conference as the keynote speaker. Thank you so very, very much. We Thank enjoyed you. it thoroughly. Thank you.